So tonight we're calling it Uprooting the Absalom Spirit. Uh, Trish has been teaching wonderfully. Amen. Can you give her a hand? You're, uh, you're never at a lack for scripture when uh, Trish is in the pulpit. I uh, have helped her for years putting the slides together, and uh, I'm like, you really think you're going to get through all these scriptures? It's like, I'm going to try, and then just let the Lord lead from there, and uh, it's all tied in with deliverance, and you know, if you've been a Christian any length of time, you know who Absalom was, I'm guessing, one of David's sons who kind of went rogue, and when people think of him, they think of rebellion, and um, rightfully so, but we're going to try to dig a little deeper tonight, and and try to get to some of the roots of those things and see how that might apply to our lives. Amen? So could you pray with me? Thank you, Lord, for revelation. Thank you that we're told that there's unsearchable riches in the Word of God. And we have found that to be true. There are unsearchable riches. There's so much that the rest of our lives that we spend digging in, drilling into your word, we'll never find it, all the riches that you have. But we're going to keep on trying, Lord. We're going to be men and women after your heart. We want to know your character and know your will for our lives and, and then to be people who are willing to sell out the whole route for you and lay down our lives for the, for the cause of the kingdom. And we know, Lord, the blessing is it's amazing with the obedience as much as the, the penalty that comes with disobedience. So it's a very sobering thing to look at the life of Absalom, but we're not just reading a history here. We're, we're looking at what applies, what the spiritual rules are that we need to understand and, and live by, and that we need the fear of the Lord as the beginning of the wisdom in our lives. So help us tonight to understand what you want to say to us as we break open the bread and, and eat the bread of life here tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. Open our eyes of our understanding. Um, so, uh, as you know, I, I'm a worship leader, and I was uh, a musician before I became a Christian. I, w I was 25 when I got saved, so I had uh, a lot of years of playing out in secular settings and not, not a good lifestyle. Um, so that rebellious thing was something that I understood well. And when we talk about Absalom, he rebelled against his father, David. But there was a root system there that we want to look at tonight, and want to want to just do a little bit of a background on, on well, not just the people that we're talking about in the Bible, but to l then put it through the lens of our lives and just try to look, as we're talking about the series on deliverance, often we have blind spots in our lives and other people see things and we don't always see them. And we want to be open to the Lord. We want to have people that we trust, that we can go to and say, I give you permission to speak into my life. If you're seeing something that you think is important that I need to know that you don't think I'm seeing about myself, then I would like you to speak into my life. So let's start with the first time we see the name Absalom is in 2 Samuel chapter 3. And just to give you a perspective, he's one of David's sons. We see David first in 1 Samuel, right? So the prior book in chapter 16. That's the first time his name is mentioned. And there's many chapters between there and here. And much of David's life has been kind of on the run up till now. Uh, but by the time 2 Samuel chapter 3 comes along, things, he's saying there's a long war, right, in verse 1 of 2 Samuel, uh, Samuel chapter 3, uh, the background of this Absalom spirit, there's a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David, okay? So the country was divided between the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, and, and there was rebellion going on, and Israel was, is the way it's referred to in the Bible as the northern kingdom, and Judah, Jerusalem, David... Uh, was referred to as the southern kingdom, and and Saul had died, and Saul's sons were, were trying to run it. One of the sons was Ishbosheth. Um, don't name your child that unless you want to give him a uh, some kind of I know trauma in his life. But uh, they had a lot of names in the Bible. I would say that for. But anyway, there was a long war, and 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 God can't be happy when His people are at war with each other. All right, Selah. Right? Like, say lie. Even Christians are upset with each other about different stances that we've taken on vaccine and COVID and all these other political issues that, that we all face. And that's exactly, pretty fast on your feet, Carolyn. That's exactly what the devil would want, is for us to be divided. A house divided cannot stand. So let's major on the majors, not on the minors. Okay? So they're at war. And it says, but David grew stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. Now, I just want to throw out something here to you because it was pretty obvious to everybody but Saul that David was the rightful leader of the country. 
And let's remember that Saul could have said, you know what, I know the people wanted a king and, and I was named the king, even though I was hiding in the baggage when you guys were looking for me to coronate me. Or, is that it, the coronation, right? He's hiding in the baggage, there's, there's a clue. And, and he did it out of his flesh, right? He, he, he didn't have the grace to be in that office. And, and David shows up and kills Goliath and does all these amazing things. And look, Saul could have said, you know what, David? I recognize that you are the proper king, and I will turn the kingdom over to you, and I will serve under your kingdom. That is always a possibility. But what did Saul do instead? He dug in deeper, and he wanted to kill David because that's what happens. If we don't acknowledge the anointing, we are threatened by the anointing. <laughs> That's worth thinking about. The very thing that the Pharisees were praying for, that God would be with us, was with them, and they didn't recognize it. Same with Saul. The king was there, and he didn't recognize it, and he tried to kill the king. Good thing he wasn't a better javelin thrower, amen? <laughs> Maybe it was the angels deflecting those javelins that Saul was throwing at David. So it says here in verse 2 of 2 Samuel 3 that sons were born to David in Hebron. There's more than what I'm about to say, but these are key names. The first, firstborn son, and you know that's a big deal in the Bible, right? Firstborn son is a big deal, and it's not just because they're firstborn. It's because in the first century Palestine and prior, this is 700 years before Jesus was here, the oldest son was expected to take over the household if the father died. So the reason there was a double blessing for the oldest son is because there was a lot more responsibility. And people don't always realize that. They think there's this unfair advantage. But no, there's also a cost to being that firstborn. And I think that's significant in this story. We'll see if you agree with me as we go through it. But his firstborn was Amnon by Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess. And his second son, Chiliab, by Abigail. Anybody remember Abigail? She was married to Nabal. And she even acknowledged that his name meant fool. <laughs> But she was the one that intercepted David on the way to kill her whole family. And, and David said, thank you. For if you hadn't come here and, and, and spoken to me, I would have killed your whole household. And she said, that would have been a blight on your record. And God has greater plans for you. Don't let a fool pull you away from your destiny. And he said, thank you. I thank the Lord that, that you came and spoke to me. And the third one was Absalom. And interesting that he was the son of Maka, the daughter of Talmai, who was the king of Geshur, which was in Syria. All right? So Absalom not only has royal blood from David, he's got royal blood from his mother's side, too. It's a king of Syria. So do you think this guy is kind of DNA for a leader? I think I'm leading you, by the way. I asked that question. I'm hoping I'll start with easy questions. Yes, he was born to be a leader, but he wasn't born to be a renegade. All right, and we have to all recognize that whether we ever have the title of leader or not, we're leading in our sphere. If we're in a family, if you're a mom, you're leading your children. If you're a father, you're leading your household biblically, right? This is biblically. Wives should be happy about that because we're going to love you the way Christ loved the church, aren't we, men? And isn't that easy? Thank you for being honest. You are in church. So look, this is eight chapters after we see that that the, the sons were born that we talked about, and, and there was an amazing amount of warfare, but David is finally reaching a point now where he's now in charge. It's, it's 1 Samuel chapter 11, and many of you probably know it because this next part of Scripture is, is famous for the wrong reason because it says it happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle. And who's the king? A little louder, please. He's the king, and he's a warrior. That's how he became the king, by conquering between chapter 3 and 11. It's, it's king after king in that whole region. And every time they tried to make an alliance against him, David defeated them. And now he's in the palace, and at the time when he's supposed to go to war, he doesn't. David sent Joab, who was his uncle, by the way, uh, that may come into play in this story as well as we talk about it. But his servants with him, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. Not a good place for a leader to be. I just want to give another little pause here because you remember that Samuel was told to go to the house of Jesse because when God realized Saul wasn't going to get the job done, he wanted to anoint one of Jesse's sons. Remember? And Jesse shows, I'm sorry, uh, Samuel shows up at Jesse's house and he wants to see his sons. 
And, and Samuel's not hearing anything from the Lord. He's like, is this all your sons? And, and what did he say? Oh, that's right. There's one more. Doesn't that seem strange that you're, you're told to have all your sons here and, and you didn't invite David to come? Like maybe you got a little chip on your shoulder toward David because maybe he's an illegitimate child. Maybe he was from a different mom. Like we don't know all of this and I don't have time to go into it, but it's important to think that there might have been a seed of illegitimacy in the, in the, in the line of David, in his bloodline, and he might have been rejected by his brothers, which reminds you of Joseph too, right? Because now... At the time when he's supposed to step out and be the leader, he doesn't. Maybe, like Danny Silk says, there's a toolbox deficiency because he was rejected so much. And then what happens is the witch's brew of a cocktail is when he's supposed to be fighting in a war, the devil starts a war against him because he's in the wrong place. And it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked out on the roof of the house when he should have been in battle. He's on the roof of his house, and you know the rest. Bathsheba turned into a whole nine miles of bad road, wreckage in David's life because he decides when he finds out she's pregnant to have her husband killed, one of his men in his army who refuses to go home and lay with his wife because he's such a noble man in, in the army. He's like, are you kidding me? You want me to go to my house when my men are out in the field? I should be with my men. What did you even call me home for? And by the way, he probably said, you should be out there with us. You're the leader here. Gets him drunk, and he still won't go home. And you might remember Psalm 51, which is the psalm of repentance for the sin with Bathsheba. But sin has consequences. Right? And God is not happy, obviously not happy with the idea that he fell into sin with Bathsheba, but the murder of Uriah is what's specifically mentioned here in chapter 12, the next chapter. This is God speaking to David, now the sword shall never depart from your house. And that's not a compliment. That doesn't mean you are the brave warrior. There's going to be contention in your household because you have despised me. And have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house. And I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. And he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. And I didn't go into all of it, but that's pretty serious right there. That's just a few verses. Right now, I just want to be careful that as you're thinking through this story, that you think Absalom had no choice. Because God said all these terrible things were going to happen and Absalom's just a pawn in the game. No, that's not how this works, okay? Don't, don't use that as a cop-out in, in your own life and say, well, I didn't want to hit her, but she made me. <laughs> right? No. We still have the rule over our temple. And it's a temple of the Holy Spirit, okay? So God is not happy with David. He's still considered a man after God's own heart. He's still the king. But he has a major mark on his record. And it says, you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. Then chapter 13, we find out the firstborn son, Amnon, has a scheme to rape his sister. And I'm sorry for using that word. I know it's a strong word, but that's what he did. And it's his half-sister. And David has all these wives and all these different children. And he's, he's starting a really bad pattern here of marrying the daughters of other kings to avoid wars. And you know who did that more than David? Solomon. So the wind reaped the whirlwind. Not just negatively. That also works for blessings. So a blessing reap a blessing. So a curse get bigger curses. So after Absalom, the son of David, had a lovely sister whose name was Tamar, and Amnon, the son of David, loved her. Not good. That's called incest. That's a sin, right? You can love her, but not sexually love her. And he was distressed over his sister Tamar, so distressed that he became sick. She was a virgin. It was improper for Amnon to do anything to her. I'm not going into all the details of it. It's, it's hard enough. After he rapes her with the help of another one of his relatives uh, who comes up with a plan, uh, Jonadab is his cousin, I believe it was his cousin, uh, told him how to trick her and just despicable behavior. And Tamar now comes back to Absalom and he knows what's going on. She put ashes on her head, tore her robe of many colors and laid her hand on her head and went away crying bitterly. And if you remember, it says, 
that Amnon hated her more than he had loved her after he raped her. If that's not exactly the devil's brew of how this whole thing works, he's the biggest liar in the world, and he's the worst boss you can ever have. The paycheck you get from him is death. The wages of sin is death to relationships, to so many things. Absalom, her brother, said to her, Has Amnon, your brother, been with you? And then he says, But now hold your peace, my sister. He's your brother. Do not take this thing to heart. And he could have said, I'm going to take this thing to heart, and I'm going to revenge you. So Tamar remained desolate in her brother Absalom's house. And look, I've said it before, but when you talk about deliverance, sexual sin, being raped, being molested as a child is one of the most difficult things for anybody to, to wrestle with and to try to, to, to receive healing about because it scrambles our identity, okay? doesn't mean we can't get healed. We have some testimonies here. You wouldn't even want the people to tell you the detail of what happened to them. And they're, they're trophies in the kingdom of God. They're serving God. They're saved. They're, they're set free and been delivered from it. Was it easy? No, it wasn't easy. It was, it was terrible trauma. But, but God, right? That's how you have to look at anything. Nothing's too hard for God, right? So Tamar is desolate now. And, and it's so hard to try to comfort somebody in that situation. Verse 21, but when King David heard all the things that happened, meaning his oldest son, Amnon, raped David's daughter, Tamar, he was very angry. And Absalom spoke to his brother Amnon, either good or bad. Sounds a little like the godfather, right? <laughs> Maybe there's a little Sicilian in there, I don't know. But he just goes quiet. And he doesn't say anything to Amnon, even though he's harboring rage in his heart. I think against both Amnon and David, because it says David was very angry, but it doesn't say David did anything about it. That's a problem. Toolbox deficiency. Doesn't know how to handle a renegade son, because nobody handled him. What he should have done is sat Amnon down and read him the riot act and, and let everybody know that this isn't acceptable. And we don't know, we're just kind of having to read between the lines here, but we know that Absalom is in a rage about what happened. And I'm conjecturing that because David didn't do anything, Absalom took it on himself to say, I'm gonna do something about this if you're not. Is that disrespectful to his father? Yes. Is that a sin? Yes. Honor your mother and father that life may go well with you. Did he have DNA to be a leader? Both lines were kings. But nobody was showing him how to handle that line. Nobody was mentoring him the right way. And if nobody mentors you the right way, guess what? The world will mentor you the wrong way. Oh. So Absalom hated Amnon because he forced his sister Tamar. And it came to pass after two full years, two full years of being quiet and plotting and plotting. You might remember, right, when when Esau was coming back to kill his brother, Jacob, and Jacob's mom said, hey, your brother Amnon has been consoling himself by killing you. He's, he, when he dreams at night, he pictures his hands around your throat choking you. This is a problem, okay? That's not a good thing to console yourself thinking that you're going to kill somebody. But you can imagine the same things happening here. Two full years he sat on this thing and it kept on stirring up on the inside of him till finally he grabs the other king's sons and he tells them, he commanded his servant saying, watch now when Amnon's heart is merry with wine and when I say to you, strike Amnon, then kill him. Be not afraid, have I not commanded you? Be courageous and valiant. So the servants of Absalom did to Amnon as Absalom had commanded, which means they killed him. They killed the king's firstborn son. Then all king's sons arose, all the king's sons arose, and each one got on his mule and fled. And it came to pass, while they were on the way, the news came to David saying, Absalom has killed all the king's sons, and not one of them is left. Now do you see how the murder of Uriah is multiplying down the line now, and you sow the wind, and you reap the whirlwind. Now, it's not true that all the sons were killed, but he doesn't know that yet. And all the repercussions of sin, one bad decision leads to another. When the kings are supposed to go to war, the war comes to them because their guard is down. 
That's spiritual warfare. He wasn't where he was supposed to be. Maybe because he had his own identity crisis and he didn't know how to handle the leadership. He fought so hard to get it and then he got there and he didn't know what to do. So at the time they're supposed to be fighting, he stays home. And the devil finds that weak spot. See how it works? That's where we need deliverance. What was the entry point of trauma in our lives? And can we sit down with people and sit through counseling, prophetic ministry, get prayer on it, get revelation on it, repent if there's a sin, and once you repent of that sin, the devil loses the legal right to hold on to you in that area. He's a legalist. Forgiveness frees us of that condemnation because it puts it on Jesus. He's going to keep accusing us of what we did wrong, but we have to then remind him, no, I've been forgiven, and my record has been expunged. I'm forgiven. You can't accuse me of that any longer. I forgive the person who did this to me. Probably the hardest part, right, of the whole process. Who would Absalom have had to forgive in was both Amnon and David. Again, I'm projecting that, but he's born to be a leader, if he sees an absence of leadership, he's going to step in the breach and feel justified to do so, even though he's not. And it's exactly what the devil does. But I was justified to do that. That's right. But you didn't have the authority to do it. And when you cross the line and you dishonored your father, who is the king, you now have become the victim of another sin, and you're going to have to suffer the penalty of that. You see how the devil just gets us on this treadmill of never-ending mistakes that get made that don't even seem like our own fault. But if we don't understand the laws of God, whether we like them or not, if you violate them, there, there's going to be consequences. The blessing comes in what? Obedience. Obedience. You can't be obedient to something if you don't know it. If you don't have revelation on it, you just think it's you, you have every right to gossip about people or judge people or whatever, pull rank on them, all the things that Jesus warns us about. But once the revelation comes, then you still have to have the self-control not to let your emotions hijack you and go murder somebody. Hmm. So it says, the king arose, tore his garments. He thinks all his sons are dead. And he laid on the ground. All the servants stood by with their clothes. And look who it is, Jonadab, the cousin who told Amnon how to rape Tamar. Here's what you do. Pretend you're sick. Ask your father to have her come over and cook for you. This guy is now saying to David's brother, answered and said, Let not my lord suppose that they've killed all the king's sons, for only Amnon is dead. For by the command of Absalom, this has been determined from the day that he forced his sister Tamar. The very guy who came up with the plot is the one to tell David, and David doesn't know this. You see how dysfunctional families can be? Anybody got a dysfunctional family? Yeah, all right, thank you for being honest. Whoever didn't raise your hand, come in for ministry. <laughs> That'll be one of those blind spots we could help you with. Now, therefore, let not the Lord, the king, take this thing to heart to think that all the king's sons are dead, for only Amnon is dead. Like, only? My firstborn son is dead? Would he be dead if David had done the proper thing at the time that he committed that crime? If, if he had punished his son the way he needed to be punished for raping his sister? So leadership is not just what you do, it's what you don't do. Lack of leadership creates huge amounts of problems. You need the character of God in all of this, right? So the Absalom spirit is labeled as this rebellious thing, and it is certainly because this isn't all he does, right? He, he just goes haywire after a while. But wait a minute, let's just remember that a proper amount of structure in his life and a proper amount of repentance on the part of David to say, look, I'm learning as I go here. I didn't have the best example. I wasn't even invited to the party when Sam, Samuel came to anoint one of Jesse's sons. So I don't know what to do, but I'm going to work on it. I'm going to work on it with you. And people will almost always give you a break on that one because you're at least you're acknowledging you're working on it and you don't know what to do but you're working on it and you're trying all right then and, and at the end of the uh, chapter 13 it says Absalom I put out the title Absalom returns to his grandfather because obviously Absalom has to flee after he kills has his brother killed and what does he do he goes back to the other king in his bloodline his mother was the daughter of the king uh, get the names here, the king and David and all his servants wept very bitterly, but Absalom fled and went to Talmai, the son 
of Amahud, the king of Geshur, right? Remember, we saw that in his bloodline. So now he's protected because he's got the king around him and, and he gets left there. And David mourned for his son every day. All right, he's mourning for the loss of Amnon, but he's also lost in a mourning for the loss of Absalom, right? These names are getting me scrambled here. So think about it. What could I have done differently? Anybody ever ask yourself that question? Please all raise your hands, right? We all do this. We reflect on something and we think, well, I didn't make the mistake, but could I have done something to help my child not make a mistake? And look, I don't mean beat yourself up about that, but this is just normal good, uh, good uh, retracing of the steps to say, how could I have handled that differently? Where did I fall short? Where did I miss something that I didn't have? What could I go get prayer for? If I'm on the men's call tomorrow morning, I could say, hey, guys, I really need help. Can you pray for me? I have a big decision coming up. And guys are awesome with this stuff. We don't have to be ashamed of that. David mourned for his son every day. It could be Amnon, could be Absalom, could be both. So Absalom fled. He went to Geshur in there. He was there for three years. And King David longed to go to Absalom, for he had been comforted concerning the death of Amnon. So meaning he grieved the loss of his son. And Amnon did do a horrible thing, raped Tamar, right? There's consequences to that kind of behavior. And now David wants to do a reset with Absalom, but he doesn't know what to do. So Joab, remember I mentioned him, the uncle who's the general in the army, he cuts a deal, we would say today. He calls up this wise woman of Tekoa, and he says, I want you to pretend that you're, you know, I won't go into all the details of the story, but she basically talks about injustice that was being done, and she comes to David completely play acting, but she convinces David that she's telling the truth, and David says, justice will be done. You will be revenged for your son. All right, is that a good enough summary? Those of you that know what I'm talking about. She said, really? So you're going to give me justice for my son? Then why then have you schemed such a thing against the people of God? What do you think she's talking about? Shout it out, please. Help me out. His son, you didn't forgive your son and bring him back. You have banished your son. How long is this going to go on? It's brilliant language here, right? The king speaks the things as one who is guilty. You're not bringing justice. And br you said you'd bring my son back, but you're not bringing your own son back. See, Joab's a tricky guy. It's uh, David's uncle. In that the king does not bring his banished one home again. That's called forgiving people. We banish them. He's not bringing his banished one home again. For surely we all will die, right? We become like water spilled on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. Think of that picture, okay? Remember the song, The Living Years? Anybody remember that song? It's too late when they die to admit that we don't see eye to eye, so say it loud, say it clear, tell them you love them while they're here. <laughs> Sounds like a Christian song. Don't wait till they die, and then you don't have a chance to reconcile. It's exactly what she said. Time is like water that spills into sand, and you can't pull it back up again. And every year that goes by where that banished one is not getting healed, it's harder and harder to re repair that breach. And Jesus said, we've all been given the ministry of, Paul said it, quoting the Lord, we've all been given the ministry of reconciliation. So Joab took a chance. This woman lies. David could have been in a bad mood that day and had her head chopped off, right? But no. God devises means so that the banished ones are not expelled. Powerful. And he didn't kill the wise woman of Tekoa. So verse 18 in 2 Samuel 14, it says, The king answered and said to the woman, Don't hide from me anything that I ask you. And the woman said, Go ahead, let the king speak. Is the hand of Joab with you in all this? <laughs> you know, he figured out what happened. Joab tricked him by sending this woman. And the king said, All right. I have granted this thing. Go, therefore, and bring back the young man Absalom. Good, right? When you think that would be a good outcome that God would want. And Joab arose, went to Geshur, brought Absalom back to Jerusalem. And the king said, let him return to his own house, but don't let him see my face. So Absalom returned to his own house, but did not see the king's face. So you see, it's another toolbox deficiency. It's not knowing how to reconcile the conflict that's here. I see some looks going on down there. 
everybody's thinking of something right now, right? And, it, and it's not easy to deal with conflict, but it's much worse not to deal with it. Which pain do you want to choose? All right? So you see how Absalom's rebellion is kind of being fed a little bit here? Like, so you banished me for three. If you had just taken care of Amnon, you could hear how his brain would be going, right? If you had dealt with it, I wouldn't have to do it, but you did it. So I did take care of it. That's wrong, but you can understand it. And now all of a sudden you finally bring me back, but I'm, ban I'm still banished. I still can't see the king. I don't have a, an identity and a place. I haven't been forgiven. So what does he do? <laughs> now in all Israel there was no one who was praised as much as Absalom for his good looks. From the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, there was no blemish on him. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Probably not the best thing, knowing that we got this rebellious spirit thing going on, right? <laughs> and all the more, you have to steward that gift that's in this child as, as the father, right, when, when, they're, when they're being raised. To Absalom were born three sons and one daughter whose name was? Wonder where that came from. Named after his sister. He's still holding this thing, right? He's still feeling her pain. Nothing wrong with that. So he names his daughter after his sister to honor the sister who's been dishonored. So he's firing on a lot of good cylinders here, but that's not what matters. He's got, he's got to face the punishment of the sin of dishonoring his father, even though the father really, you could argue, wasn't being very honorable. And can anybody relate? <laughs> anybody here a father who hasn't always been honorable to your kids or mother? couple of hands going up of the honest people. Thank you. And Tamar was also beautiful in her appearance. So Absalom dwelt two full years in Jerusalem but not see the king's face. <laughs> so this is what a leader does. He's not getting the attention he wants. He's not going to just sit there. He's wired to be a king. So he said, Joab's field is near me and he has a barley field there. Go set it on fire. <laughs> and let, let him know that I was the one that set it on fire. Right? You get it? This is what they do. They set fires. If you're a leader and you're getting frustrated, you're not going to just sit there. I'm not saying it's right to destroy people's property. Okay? He's not operating off of, of a redeemed mindset. But he is operating like a leader. If, if things stall, he moves. Because, look, life, you know, you don't get that time back. Right? Now, again, I'm not justifying it. But it was David's job to, to, to confront these things. Get it? Uh, I'm not... I'm not trying to say that what Absalom did was right, but it's understandable because there was a void. Maybe that helps you to forgive people who've hurt you. They had similar kinds of voids. They just didn't know what to do. Or they were threatened by your gift or a million things we could think of here, right? And Absalom answered Joab, why have I come from Gesher? It would have been better for me to just have stayed there. You brought me home, but I've still been in isolation. What's the point? Therefore, let me see the king's face. And here's another thing a leader would say. But if there's iniquity in, in me, then kill me. <laughs> Gotta admire that, right? He's like throwing down. He's like, let's put it on the table. That's what one of my bosses used to say. Put the skunk on the table. Let's just deal with this thing. Stop keeping it hidden under your desk and squirting perfume. Just put the skunk on the table. I know, that's quite the picture, right? Like he's just saying, like, ultimatum. You either let me go free because you brought me back here. And what, what do you think? I was coming back to what, to sit in my house? I'm a leader. And Joab went to the king and told him. And when he had called Absalom, he came to the king and bowed himself to his face to the ground before the king. And the king kissed Absalom, okay? Now, it maybe shouldn't have taken two years, but David got a toolbox efficiency in my translation here. And, and at least he's doing that. At least he's trying to reconcile because look when, when you see all the dysfunction in David's family it's it's immense okay and it was sowing the wind and reaping the whirlwind because Solomon right like wow the, the nation went from the peak under David's leadership to that night on the roof was the beginning of the downfall of the whole country like you could really trace it to that moment when he didn't flee like Joseph fled from Potiphar's wife Keep the coat. I don't need the coat. But he kisses Absalom, but that's the beginning of boom. 
now Absalom has permission to be the renegade leader. So it says, after this happened, Absalom provided himself, key word, no authority. David didn't give him the authority to do it. I believe he's judging his father as a weak leader. And because of that, he's just going to take matters into his own hands. He didn't deal with Amnon, so why would he deal with me? I'm just going to go, go rogue. Fifty men ran before him. We know he's the best looking guy in the city. He's David's son. He's charismatic. And he's a king. He's got it in him to lead. Big problem. Now Absalom would rise early, stand beside the way to the gate. So it was whenever anyone who had a lawsuit came to the king for a decision. Who came to the king? You're not the king. Just a clue, Absalom. You're not the king. He didn't care. Absalom would say, what city are you from? Oh, if I were made a judge in the land and everyone who has had any suit or cause came to me, I'd give him justice. Right? Man, it's just leaking out all over the place. This animosity he has towards what he perceives as a weak father. And so what? I know David was not weak. He was a warrior until it came to things he didn't understand. When it came to the leadership piece, he did fine getting up to that point, but then it was like, okay, I need, I need some counsel here, and he didn't get it. Anyway, I don't know. I could be going too far with that, but you get my point. So uh, whenever he, anyone came near him, they knew he was the king's son. He's a good-looking guy. He would put out his hand and take him and kiss him, right? So Absalom, in this manner, Absalom acted toward all Israel who came to the king for judgment, and here's the line. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. The thief comes louder. Steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that you might have life abundantly. His identity was not to be a thief. His identity was to be a leader, but he wasn't proper, again, my interpretation, he wasn't properly mentored in that role because I don't think David knew how to do that. And, and that's evident from other relationships that David had. And I don't hold that against David. Because if he didn't have it, it's hard to give what you didn't get. But boy, do we do this to people all the time. We put expectations on them based on our grid. But we can't go back into their life and know what their grid was like when they were growing up. Half the time, they got pain that they won't even want to tell you about. Because what good's going to come from that? A lot of people think. You with me? Tracking? All right, because... We could have just talked about rebellion, but I think it's a little deeper. So it came to pass, I don't know if you ever saw this, 40 years. This is the condition where Absalom is usurping authority from his father for 40 years. That is a long time and a big number in the Bible. 40 is a big number. You can look it up. There's multiple times that, that comes up. 40 times. So David is getting older now. We don't know if it's getting addressed or not, but we do know that Absalom decides, it's my time. I'm going to just overthrow the government. And we say he's a rebellious kid. He is, no doubt about it. But what's the root system? Because when there's a root system, there's a fruit. And if you get to the root, you change the fruit. And this is what we have to learn today, is look in the mirror about our own leadership. Not to shame ourselves. Forgive yourself and ask for help because you're, you're in a house that wants to help. Are we going to get it right 100% of the time? No, come on. Nobody gets it right 100% of the time. But are we going to give it our best shot 100% of the time? Yeah. You know why? Because we got free. <laughs> and, and we don't want anybody to not get free. But it's pretty hard to, to hit them over the head and force them to do something. They've got to want it. Right? You have to want to get deliverance most of the time. It's not to say God can't miraculously do what he did with the demoniac. It sure didn't look like the demoniac wanted to get delivered, right? But look, you know, God can do anything, but it sure helps if, if we're working with people that they recognize there's a problem and they want to deal with it. Amen? Okay, that's what I'll leave on that. Forty years, Absalom said to the king, please let me go to Hebron and pay the vow. He's totally making this up. What does that remind you of in David's life? Bathsheba gets pregnant. He talks to one of his officers. Put Uriah on the front of the line and then pull back. And when they kill him, tell everybody that he died in battle. 
Remember Jacob? He was the deceiver, and he got deceived by Laban. You know your Bible, right? You paying attention, Easter? Oh, I don't want to call you out. Wait. Go ahead. Four. So it might be an interpretation mistake. There's a disagreement. Yeah. Let's say four. <laughs> it's still a long time. You know, this kid got upset after two years. Yeah, I, I probably should have done a little more homework and said there's a debate about four or 40. Fair point. But look, that's still a long time to be waiting for somebody to take action as a leader when you're wired. So... <laughs> I was kind of hoping it wasn't 40, to be honest, because that seems like a really long time. I mean, David's an old man by then. The bigger point is there's a repeating of a process here. David lied, and now David's being lied to. So Absalom comes and says, hey, please let me go to Hebron and pay the vow which I made to the Lord. For your servant took a vow while I dwelt at Gesher. This is a complete fabrication, Right? And if the Lord indeed brings me back to Jerusalem, then I'll serve the Lord. Absalom sent, sent spies through the land, tribes of Israel saying, Absalom reigns in Hebron. That's the rebellion. That's the revolt, right? And I don't want to take all the time to go through all the chapters that come after this. All of 16, all of 17 are all about David having to leave in disgrace, people cursing him as he's leaving the town. Here's this guy that was just named the king by Samuel. God says, a man after my own heart. God says, there's going to be a covenant relationship between God and you, David, and your son is going to rule and reign forever. He wasn't talking about Solomon, was he? Solomon did become the king after David, but he was talking about Jesus. And all of that is getting messed up on the surface, at least. It's looking like it is. Because you pay me now or you pay me later. The pain of regret is I had my opportunity and I missed it. I missed the day of my visitation. The pain of discipline is I've got to force myself to do things that are difficult. I don't know what to do, but I know what the Bible says I'm supposed to do, so let me step up and, and do it afraid, do it awkward, but at least I'm showing the Lord I want to try. And boy, people will work with you and God will work with you. So he spreads the word through all of, of the, the nation that's been unified, David flees and Absalom takes Jerusalem. And again, I didn't want to go through all these you know, individual verses and chapters. I'm trying to drill down and just give you the principles that, that we have seen over the years of doing this and teaching the Elijah House material and possessing your vessel and things that we refer to all the time. I, I could have given you a grid of the 40 chapters in the four books and all the different topics that are covered in, in all of that material that the Sanford's put together. And bitter root judgment would have been one of the things that would have been applicable here, all right? That, that Absalom made a bitter root judgment against David. We don't know if David made a bitter root judgment against his father, Jesse, for leaving him out in the field, for not including him in, for, for making him feel like he was rejected. But there's clearly fruit that would indicate there's got to be a root with all this dysfunction. Because even with Abigail, and even with all these wives that he kept taking, it was like it was filling a need that God meant to say, you, you can only fill your, that need with your relationship with me. These things fade, right? And that's the woman that met, that, that met Jesus at the well. She had had five relationships, and now she's in the sixth one. Like, how many times did she have a wedding planner come? <laughs> like, how many photo photographers did she hire? And, I mean, you, you just feel so sorry. Five times you got married, and, and it's still not working, and now you're not even married to the guy. And Jesus, instead of going right to the sin when he meets her, he says, I got a different kind of water. You came to the well for water, but I've got a different kind of water. If you drink from the water I give you, you'll never be thirsty again. He wasn't just talking about water, right? He was saying, you're trying to quench your thirst for identity in your relationships with men. How's it working? But we do it. We do the same things over and over. Well, I married the wrong person, but I'll find the right one out there. Oh, really? Not if you don't deal with your stuff. You're just going to recreate that worse because you sow the wind, you reap. I won't tell you to watch the movie, but there was a movie out uh, called Fatal Attraction. Oh, boy. 
you got, you know, like it's, it's too foul to recommend from the pulpit, but you know, like the storyline, oh, what could happen? Your life could end, basically. That's what could happen. So that's, that's what we're trying to take away here is not that we're just reading history, but how do the, how do the principles that surface through all this, the, the truths that God is trying to show us, the revelation that we get to obey is better than sacrifice. To rebel is as the sin of witchcraft, right? So whether, that per, whether you feel that person, father and mother, in this example of that I'm trying to say, deserves to be honored, the law says you honor them. And if you don't, life doesn't go well for you. First commandment with a promise. So is Absalom about rebellion? Yes. Is it also about bitter root judgments against your father who, who shortchanged you and didn't give you what you wanted? Yes. Would it have been great to have everything that you needed? Yes. Can God still work with you? Absolutely. And one of the biggest hindrances to growing in the Lord is holding that resentment and that unforgiveness towards whoever it was. Could have been a football coach. Could have been a million different people that you trusted that let you down. And you have every right to be mad at them, but that's the pain of regret. That's, that's crippling you from continuing into the path of growth that God wants. You've got to let them go and forgive them. All right, so it says Ahithophel was one of the advisors to Absalom as he's now considering himself the king. Go to your father's concubines. Sound familiar? Remember what God said? Out in the public, you did it in secret. You had sex with Bathsheba in secret. You had her husband killed in secret. I'm going to shame you in front of the whole country. Well, I don't, again, I, I want to be careful how I say that. I want to be more careful with my words. God didn't shame him because then it's like they didn't have a choice. No, it's the wages of sin is death. You, you, you took it lightly that you could have sex with this woman who wasn't your wife, and then you took it lightly that you could kill her husband who's one of your, I don't know if he was a general, but he was an officer. Really? And you don't think there's a consequence to that? You bet there is. So here we go. All of Israel will hear that you are abhorred by your father. So Ahithophel is using the, the language and, and the thinking of the world and say, they'll know that you really are not going to let your father back in if you sleep with all his concubines in public. Isn't that exactly what the devil wants to feed you? Shame your father. Huh. They'll know. They'll hear that you are abhorred by your father because you shamed him openly. Then, then the hands of all who are with you will be strong. Meaning, oh, we can really put our, our, we can give our tribute now to the new king, Absalom. So they pitched a tent for Absalom on the top of the house. And Absalom went into his father's concubine in the sight of the whole country. See, like the wages of sin, man. I'll tell you what. Count the cost. Count the cost. Before you make a decision. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? If there's any doubt that there's anything, you know, be careful. I'm not saying live in fear. Live in fear of the Lord. <laughs> Don't come close to the line. Don't walk right up to the edge. Just say, no, I get one shot in this life, and I'm not giving the devil uh, uh, an easy shot to hit me in one of my weak areas. So, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap it up, and then we can have time for, uh, for prayer. But, you know, there's been enough themes, I think, that you could see coming out of this that we are the result of this, the facts in our life. And every, every single person has different facts. They, in, in our business that I work in, they call it a fact pattern. There's a certain amount of every one of us is like a fingerprint. We all have our own fingerprint. We, we all have our own life. But then the grid of the word of God lays over the top of all of the dysfunction of our life. And if we're willing to work through God's grid, he will get us to a place of wholeness. Because it says right in Luke 4, he opened up the scroll of Isaiah and he read, the, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, is anointed me to preach the good news, to set the captives free. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. This is the acceptable year of the Lord, the day of the vengeance of our God. That meant jubilee, the 50th year when all debts are forgiven. Jesus is jubilee every day, not just the year. It's in you, the spirit is in you, but all the baggage tries to control our GPS. You get free of the baggage, you get a new download, fresh software from the Lord, and now you're operating on a different algorithm. And now all of a sudden, the things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. Look what the Lord has done. He healed my body. 
He touched my mind. He saved me just in time. Remember? Man, I'm going to praise his name. <laughs> I see the light. So the people went out into the field to battle against Israel. And the battle was in the woods of Ephraim. And the people of Israel were overthrown there before the servants of David. See, I'm all the way up to chapter 18. David is living in isolation, but all the people come to him that were loyal to him. And they say, you're the right king. We know who the right king is, and we want to fight for you, but we don't want you to even have to go into the battle. You could stay behind and, and strategize for us, but we'll go fight. I don't know if you remember all this. I didn't have time to go into all those verses. This is a rich portion of scripture to study. Wrong chapter? It's not 18? Oh, Samuel. Okay. That's a mistake. I'll, I'll fire my editor. Guilty. Sorry. The people of Israel are overthrown there before the servants of David. So David's men win the battle. A great slaughter of 20,000 took place there that day. For the battle there was scattered over the face of the whole countryside. And the woods devoured more people that day than the sword devoured. Huh. Absalom rode on a mule. The mule went under the thick bows of a great terebinth tree. And his head got caught in the terebinth tree. Right? Like, wow. And not, and not the outcome that God would have wanted for Absalom. No way. This guy had a package of gifting. Right? Not the way he should have ended. And verse 9, and I'm sorry, it should be 1 Samuel 18. 2 Samuel, sorry, 18. He was left hanging between heaven and earth. Like, I know this is specifically saying that that's a true thing, but isn't that often, like, how you feel? <laughs> it's like dual meaning. And the mule that was under him went on, but he's stuck in the tray. Your sin will find you out. And you're hanging between heaven and earth. Oh, man, Lord, help us with revelation. I don't know, maybe just a couple of little themes here that I could tell you that have happened to people over the years. As deliverance has happened, as the counseling has happened, they come to us and they give us sometimes very consistent kind of themes. The first thing is it's a really humbling experience, right? You have to recognize that, well, they even say it in AA. The first step is to recognize that you're not God. And that you have to turn your life over to the power of someone else. But, but what we were born with, that spirit that we were born with, always thinks that that's everybody else's problem, but not mine. And it's very humbling to sit in an AA meeting and say, I'm at that place now where I know if I don't do something, I'm probably going to die. Right? Because my life is out of control, and I need to submit my life to somebody else's control. That's because it's, AA is a Christian program. Came all right from biblical principles, right? So that's one of the first things that people tell us is on the other side of the healing, they're much more humble because they recognize they had this huge blind spot and, and they felt uh, justified to take the position they were taking, but it was an unhealthy position. And God's revelation opened that up to them and now that's gone. And then the other thing is they're much less judgmental of other people because you start to look in the mirror and say, wow, there was all that stuff going on, and I thought I was this, but the reality that God saw was this, and now I'm over here, and I'm not really exactly where I fully want to be, but I'm sure going in the right direction. I'm not going that way back into the pit. So now it's a little bit easier to talk to other people and say, hey, look, you know, I know what you're going through feels hard, but God is really good. And he can help you with this thing. Let's pray. Let's ask him to give revelation on the root cause of the problem. And just this weekend, so many people told us that he did that. Encountering God. Right? There's just no better way to get healed than to encounter the presence of God. Amen. Let's stand. Really sad how this ended. It says in verse 10, a certain man saw it, told Joab and said, I just saw Absalom hanging in a terebinth tree. And the ten young men who, were, who bore Joab's armor surrounded Absalom and struck him and killed him. That is not the way he was supposed to die. 
right? So, a lot to think about. But the one thing that we know for sure is Jeremiah 29, 11. You all know it? I know the plan I have for you, says the Lord. Come on, Easter. Prosper. And not to harm you. Give you hope and a future. And he had that. Look, you know, nobody gets dealt the perfect hand. Everybody's got something they got to deal with. But that's the beauty of it, right? Because he makes all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and are called. Anybody here called according to his purpose? Has he working things together for good for you? Do you always know how he's going to do it? No. But we trust that he is. That's what it says in 2 Chronicles 20. When we don't know what to do, our eyes are on you. Right? Help us, Lord. So, Lord, I just thank you for your people that are here tonight. And we don't want to be rebellious people. We don't want to go rogue in different situations in our lives. So we ask you to open the eyes of our understanding, as we said when we started. And we pray, Father, we just pray that, that you would warn us, the Holy Spirit would be activated in us to warn us when we're starting to walk up to the edge of disobedience or, or, or a blind spot, that we surround ourselves with people who would hold us accountable so that we don't fall victim to the enemy's plots and schemes. We want to be aware of them, of his devices, and not give place to the enemy. Lord, we thank you for David. We thank you that he was a man of God. Yes, flawed, but a man after your own heart. You don't expect us to be perfect, but you, you expect us to be pursuing you. So we all, Lord, we reach out and say, we want to be in pursuit of you right now. Whatever that means for each one of us is going to be different. But we can all be men and women that are chasing after your heart. So as we get revelation, Lord, help us press in. Help us lean into what you show us and get healed of it and move on into the full identity of who you called us to be. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Love you all. Thank you for coming out.